kind of them. Um, one of the uh, books that they were um, dishing out, if I, if I may, from oh, yes, PC. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure you'll be able to see this uh, on Blog TV. Um, it is called The Man in the Red Underpants. <laughs> Uh, it's not entirely clear um, who this is supposed to be, but I know that uh, PZ has already um, posted on Forangular. Uh, I think you were under the impression that he was supposed to represent science. It, it's, it's so badly written, it's hard to tell who he's supposed to represent. The first, the first um, reference to the man in the red underpants that I found came on page four uh, with the question, what would you do if a man in a pair of red underpants, came knocking on your door saying he'd come to read the gas meter. <laughs> <laughs> but... And if that doesn't compel you to accept religion, what <laughs> <laughs> uh, But again, uh, PC has already um, mentioned on his uh, uh, blog site for Angular um, an update of Paley's Watch. I'm going to ask perhaps to kick off PC with... Oh, um, sure. The update, which I think really puts a totally different complexion on Paley's argument. Yes, this will change your whole view of Paley's watchmaker on the Heath argument. He says, now what if I told you that I was walking along in the desert of Arabia and picked up a mobile phone, which I found just lying there? You get it? Radical change. You know, Heath has turned into a desert and the watch has turned into a mobile phone, so he's definitely updated it for the future. And does yeah. the argument get any better? No, it does not get any better. <laughs> <laughs> when you read the rest, it is exactly the same as William Paley's argument that, oh man, this is really complicated, it must have been created by a designer, therefore when we find complicated things in the natural world, they must have also been created by a designer. <laughs> and that's and it. And it, it couldn't have been the product of reproduction that two mobile phones had mated and then produced another. <laughs> and that there would be a variety of offspring of the mobile phones for like Nokia and Sprint and AT&T and that they would diversify and spread out. No, that couldn't be. That couldn't be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got somewhat ahead of myself, though, because um, what I was going to hopefully ask um, the, the panelists um, PC, starting with you, you you're, um, and I don't mean this in an offensive way, you're a veteran of this sort of event. Uh, you've mm -hmm. appeared at many. Um, how does this compare? The meeting as a whole? Yeah. Oh, man, I can't diss all the other ones, but... <laughs> no, it's been a very good I, meeting. You've got a live audience here, so yeah. you, you know, I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> no. They paid a hundred euros to be here. Yeah. Where's my cut? <laughs> Let them anyway. know that it was well invested. Yeah. Uh, no, it was, it was a very good meeting. Uh, one of the big differences in this meeting and other meetings I've been to is this one tried to bring out the more participatory nature of the discussions by having more panel discussions where they would, there, there were only a couple of, of, you know, the formal lectures where somebody stands up there and yells at you for an hour. Um, most of them were groups of little panel discussions of four people. Each one would spend about ten minutes summarizing a, uh, an issue, and then they would open it up to questions. And so one of the things we noted here is, man, these atheists ask a lot of questions. <laughs> they're, just, they're just yapping off the entire time, and, and um, none of these, they just say, okay, it's time to stop. We'll move on to the next one. Uh, so that that was that was very impressive, and I think it's just a, an indicator of the kinds of discourse that Aethos got, all that kind of great stuff, and that was what was going on this weekend. Yeah, I didn't also notice that uh, despite much encouragement, it is virtually impossible to get an entire room full of atheists to dance a jig. <laughs> <laughs> what were you? Um... You weren't supposed to tell them about that. <laughs> What, what stood out for you over the weekend, Darren? Oh. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Sorry. It becomes effortlessly for me. All right, Dr. Frank, what was the highlight of your weekend? I'd say being surrounded by so many interesting people, having you know, intimate conversations with some of them, staying up till six. So um, I'm trying to get some Skype calls coming in, and I, I'm uh, not having the best of results with that. Is there anyone in the audience who wants to raise any issues, or should we carry on Muslim bashing? <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Woo!
because I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, that was the wrong way of putting it. I think you actually had a discourse with uh, some of them, you, yourself yes. and Aaron. Uh, the of this gang of Muslims that showed up here was his fellow Sortsis, who apparently. Hansa Sortsis or something, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, he has a bit of a reputation around here. Um, uh, I will say that he was polite and well-mannered and also fairly glib. Uh, he was fairly intelligent in his conversations. I noticed, though, that as we were arguing, he got progressively more... I don't know how to describe this. You could just see him quivering as he continued the discussion, and I was kind of afraid he would explode at some point. Yes, that Aaron Raw backing me up, so I, I was okay. Um, the kinds of arguments that he was making were really unremarkable rehashes of Christian creationism. There was absolutely nothing original in anything he's arguing from. Uh, you know, it was largely a philosophical argument where he said there has to be a first cause. Uh, he would occasionally recruit in a little bit of poorly understood physics, which he typically got wrong. Um, and reverse embryology. I'm a biologist. And um, they claim that the Koran has a very specific description of the embryology of humans that could not possibly have been known to Muhammad in his time. Which actually sets up an interesting conundrum, because uh, most of our argument, what he'd say is, well, your, your empirical demands are you're addressing your complaints. And then when I turn around and ask them, okay, well, let's, what's the evidence for your belief? They, they immediately trotted out empirical evidence that they claimed was good. Um, and foremost among these is, are these claims about how the Koran describes various ph phenomena, like that the mountains have roots and that embryos go through developmental stages. Yeah. Uh, the uh, and, and what I did is, um, in my argument with him, I explained that, first of all, the descriptions of embryology in the Koran are very, very poor. They're very vague. Uh, that, for instance, when you, when you look in the Koran at their description of embryology, they've got two stages. And one stage looks like a clot of blood, and the other stage uh, looks like a chewed piece of gum. That's the level of description we have here. And also, um, the other interesting thing about the, the descriptions in the Koran is that they actually correspond fairly well to the kinds of descriptions that you find in the common medical and uh, scientific literature of the era. <coughs> that at the, at the time of Muhammad, of course, uh, doctors would have received training in the books of Galen and Aristotle and Hippocrates. And it was basically the same story as Aristotle, Galen. Well, what this is obviously indicating is the most rational way to interpret this is that Muhammad was receiving information from the doctors and learning the parts that were wrong he was getting, uh, but sorts of and ignorant at this time that they couldn't possibly know anything. <laughs> that, you know, I got isolated from everybody else, and that's why it's so magical that he generates a description that resembles at, at the time of Muhammad, Muhammad was part of a trading cartel, backward place, but at the same time it was trained in the courts of, of uh, Northern, North Africa and Egypt and places like that that were actually quite scholarly and educated. So that, that was no excuse at all. Uh, also it ignores the fact that some of the claims that sperm comes from a place between the ribs and the back which we know better as kidneys. <laughs> <laughs> so kidneys produce sperm is the message from the Koran. Ideas uh, from east and west. Uh, it's also wrong, of course. No, kidneys do not produce sperm. Uh, that's, that's, that's the role of the testes, which <coughs> they hit. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> yes. Yeah, and, and, and at that time they had, they had some primitive idea what your testes are for. <coughs> According to the science of the 7th century, is they were little counterweights to hold open the ducts that allowed sperm to... F yes, that's, that's what they, they claim they're for. Uh, and, and of course, that, that's also wrong, right? Uh, but that's in the Koran, and, and no, sources didn't happen to mention that this information was not acquired by divine revelation, because presumably Allah knows the right answer. No. It's a brave assumption, no. Aaron. What was yes. your experience with them? Uh, my, my experience was from some other scientist. I didn't catch the name. Uh, but they said that he's an embryologist when 
PZ yes. says, well, he's wrong. Well, he's an embryologist. That's his field. And PZ said, it's mine, too. <laughs> <laughs> and they stopped and they said, it is? <laughs> Probably should have read the program before he said it. <laughs> uh, it, it probably the, the highlight for me on this was that PZ was doing very well, but of course, in all of these in all of these discussions, it's not about the content. It's it's about trying to confuse your opponent so that your opponent can't make an intelligent yeah, argument. Thank you very much. Yeah. Finally, somebody said that. Yes. <laughs> Finally. So they use they use rapid fire nonsense and idiocy, and they, maybe they don't see it as idiocy. Somehow, to them, it sounds logical. And I, I apologize. I know people think I'm, uh, you know, confrontational. I'm wearing this because of last week's show when everybody gave me all that hell for being rude to that other guy that refused to answer questions. So I'm wearing it in order that, yeah, I understand the criticism. I'm being, you know, confrontational. I'm standing on the street, unable to stay out of this argument. I know that they are, are after him because he has a name and he has a presence. They have these gigantic movie cameras. I swear it was this big, and they had it in his face. <laughs> And I'm steaming as I'm standing in the street. I want into this fight. <laughs> Tag team. <laughs> I, had exactly, sorry, I had exactly the same conversation on the Friday. So I was the guy with the baggage that they were referring to. Can, can I just pause you there? Um, I, I hope people uh, on board, can you just check? Can people hear the comments from the audience? From can the you side? hear the comments from the audience? If, not, if not, I'll just repeat them. Okay. okay. Um, no, they cannot. No. Okay. And your point was, uh, you had the similar yeah, conversation exactly with them. Yeah. I mean, it, so far as I understand it, um, there doesn't seem to be a significant difference between what they're saying and what, for example, Ray Comfort is saying. Would that, is that, would that, I mean, they put a different spin on it. Uh, uh, Sortis is a little more polished. Uh, you know, Comfort is a clown. <laughs> but what was interesting is that, uh, as I don't just understand. a second, Aaron, I think you've got your mic on now. Okay, I turned it on because I thought it would help. Ah. <laughs> I thought okay. that would help. Don't, don't try and help, Aaron. <laughs> okay, but anyway, as was mentioned, that you know, the, the, their intent was to sow confusion, as you just mentioned, as an audience member over here just mentioned. Um, that what would happen is I would be making this argument, I'd be saying these things about embryology, for instance, and all of a sudden, Sartes would stop and spew out a bunch of philosophical gobbledygook about Kant or whatever, just yeah. rattle off this stuff, bring everything to a halt, you know, stop me from talking about the empirical evidence for my side. Uh, the other tactic he used was if I was talking about embryology, I was just starting to make progress in getting this across to him, he'd immediately switch to something and say, well, oh, what about the roots of the mountains? It's predicted in the Koran. And, and this is classic creationist maneuver, is shit, change the subject whenever something is going wrong with your argument. And uh, never, uh, sorry, uh, uh, we'll come to you, we'll take questions, but um, yeah. rather than just having interruptions. And because it's a family show, I do want to emphasize that when P said, PZ said, um, can't, that spelt with a K. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, the German philosopher, <laughs> Kant. Yes, okay. Uh, Dr. Yes, Frank. Family show. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, um, I didn't meet with these guys last night at all, but um, I recently had a strange experience with the state of scientific literacy in the Arab world. I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Mindfield, which is a book about brain science and how brain science might change the way that we look at ourselves as human beings and so on. Very interesting book. It was translated into various languages, and it was bought by uh, Arab Scientific, which is based in Lebanon, I think. Uh, and suddenly they sent the contract back with a little note saying, oh, we've read this now, and we can't possibly publish this. Because there's a, a chapter on uh, what we know about religion and the brain. And you know, temporal lobe epilepsy will bring on you know, religious um, experiences and, and stuff like that. And I think I mentioned that it's possible that Muhammad's uh, revelations actually came, you know, under, you know, epileptic seizures in the temporal lobes. So they, they can't even publish something like this for such a remark. And it, it's a book about science. This is really disheartening, I think. And in a time when, you know, the Arab world is, is apparently politically moving on, I'm right. wondering how long this is, is going to go on there. Mm -hmm. Kind of scary, I think. 